I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and this is Politics for People Who Hate Politics. Um, or, I guess, as Joe decided it should be called, Stag Blog After Dark. And we're talking about nothing that would warrant such a moniker, but I guess that's okay. It's still a good name. Um, I have a ridiculously packed panel tonight for some reason, so I'm hoping the more the merrier pays off. Um, half of them can't figure out their lower thirds, including... Kyle Platt, who does technical things for Liberty.me, so that's rough. It's on an iPad. <laughs> but I'll introduce you all um, just the same. I have my regulars, Joe, um, Michelle, and Corey. You don't even need their last names because they've, are, they've been here every single time. Um, you have Kyle Platt, who forgot to tell me his official Liberty.me title, but he does lots of things for them. The but, digital uh, media coordinator. Thank you, Kyle. Um, that's good. And I also uh, pestered Jesse Walker enough to drag him into the Google e 21st century. And um, Jesse gets a proper intro because I know what he does and he's an adult compared to the rest of us. Um, Jesse is the books editor of Reason magazine and sometimes he's the managing editor. It's hard to keep track. He is the author of the Radio One Rebels on the Air. I mean to read it someday. And the... Um, Really awesome United States of Paranoia, which I would hold up and plug, but someone from the ah, someone from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette stole my copy, which uh, Jesse kindly gave me. But thanks for uh, joining my panel, everybody. Um, I think that we should just start. Um, let's talk about how super depressing Iraq is right now. Um, and I don't know. Ba basically, the uh, the the Al Qaeda offshoot that is so bad that Al Qaeda kind of told them to sod off is taking over the country. And Republicans, from what I can tell, are blaming Obama for this because that's the awesome thing about intervention is that much like intervention in the economy, like stimulus style, like if you if, if it didn't work, you didn't do it enough. And that's kind of what I'm getting from Republicans. Um, and now there's various talk of going back to Iraq. And it's super depressing and making me rant. And what do you guys think about this? Open-ended. If you killed Saddam Hussein, I mean, that would be the natural thing to do would be to go in and prop him up as a new dictator. But he's not available now. <laughs> I, I, I think you're just up the creek. Could we do like a weekend at Bernie's thing? Where you yeah, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> that would be... Um, I don't know what happened to his uh, corpse, and it's probably not in the best state for that sort of wacky shenanigans. I know. Um, I'm sorry. I had to inject some humor. This is really sad. Really it, sad. Isn't it? And, and, like, I don't know why. I mean, I, I spent the last two days arguing with, like, a conservative and a um, someone who said they were a libertarian, and they both were really pro-Iraq war even now. And They weren't a fucking libertarian then. Well, I mean, I don't. I, I, I've got convinced by um, Anthony Gregory and Sheldon Richmond about like war being the biggest, you know, bullshit um, and the biggest sort of deal breaker. But you, Corey, have said that even like the Leonard Peikoffs of the world, they could be a libertarian. They're just not libertarian on war. Um, I'm just like adamantly like pro Iraq after the eight years we were there, and is now talking about going back in there. Uh, despite the uh, abject failure that it was, I don't, I don't know. I have a hard time even taking them seriously as a thinker, let alone as a libertarian. What's really <laughs> funny is that nothing turns Democrats into war hawks quicker than, like, the prospect of winning. Like, yeah, we could be the ones that do it right this time. Yeah, and they have that reputation of being softies, and I think that they try to overcompensate for that. I mean, a Democrat... Used nukes. Like the, it was a Democrat. The only person who ever used nuclear weapons on other humans was a Democrat. So I don't know why they're overcompensating so much. And also, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? I mean, uh, I think that. But it, it, it's the Republicans pushing against them, and, and nobody's ever warmongery enough for a, a mainstream Republican. Um, and that's become clear lately. I'm not sure if anyone's you know caught up on this in the last couple hours, but Obama has said. This is basically breaking news that they're going to support the, you know, Iraqi government. They haven't ruled out airstrikes, but according to what I've just read, actually, it's two hours old, that 
Obama has ruled out additional ground forces. Well, that's good. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's at least something. It doesn't look like. I mean, that could all go to hell though in about 20 minutes if they decide that you know. The last thing I had heard was him saying that nothing was off the table. And they always say that. It just terrifies that's, me when they say they it. I know, it. I know it means nothing, but really, nothing is off the table? Nothing? <laughs> they thought about nuking uh, Korea during the war. I don't know Jesus. if they ever considered it in Vietnam. It's just... I mean, and, there's, there's no cap on the power they have, so you know, they can just do whatever they want whatever they feel like, there's no... I mean, who's going to tell them no? Congress already gave Obama the power to do whatever he wants. <laughs> or the, you know, the War Time Acts or whatever the hell they call it. So, you know, we could have some drone warfare and then in, you know, 30 days we could have more troops on the ground. And, you know, would, how many people would really object to that at this point? Other than, you know, the libertarians in the world. But... I mean, I, I was on a bit of a tan like a, a rant today. I was talking to Eric Garris um, from Antiwar.com, and he was giving me tales of libertarianism of yore. He was telling me about, you know, the the Libertarian Party in 1974 rejecting uh, uh, party platforms, like really rigidly anti-war and pro draft dodger amnesty platforms, and like it just I'm, I'm just feeling really cranky because I think that even libertarians basically with the exception of a lot of the people on this very panel are very like they wuss out on war and they definitely wussed out on Iraq. The first few years of the LP there's this strong kind of object not objectivist but you know Randian overlay and I, th I think the original platform even had like some deliberate language about the proper role of government is you know I mean there's stuff that was kind of aggravated um, the, the more radical people and then in the mid-70s um, it became a very Rothbardian, at least for about a decade. So, I think Eric Garris would, would I mean, he would not have experienced that in like 1979, I think. He, it would have been like a minority rump trying to make those kinds of arguments. So, that's good. I mean, it just sounds like not unlike Rothbard himself. Like, yeah. Yeah. they were sensible in like a little middle period, and then there was, you know, it just, um, I'm also like reminded of of being a Students for Liberty and seeing uh, John Stossel and David Bowes talk about um, uh, war, and they were talking about Hiroshima, and they both said it was justified. And not five minutes before, John Stossel's like, "Well, killing children is, isn't okay." I mean, there's there's, there's like, I clearly am incredibly naive because I just like libertarians. How could they get the biggest worst thing that governments can do so wrong so often. Well, Lucy, when I hear you or Anthony Gregory talk about libertarians being bad on war, especially at the beginning of the Iraq war, it's it's really interesting to me because I didn't experience any of that. I'm one of those people that discovered libertarianism through Ron Paul. And so libertarianism to me has always just been inherently anti-war. That's been the biggest issue. So it's interesting to me when I hear like Gregory talk about, yeah, at the beginning of the Iraq War, it was bad. It was like a like a fifty fifty split or something. It yeah, wasn't I mean, a fifty fifty split then. I mean, it, that was, um, or it, there was a sort of illusion because institutionally, just about all the um, libertarian in, um, like uh, organizations were against the Iraq War or were clearly leaning that way if they didn't have official positions. But there's this whole network of unaffiliated bloggers that call themselves libertarians, but they were just sort of like socially liberal conservatives, but on foreign policy they were really hawkish. But they sucked up a lot of the oxygen of, of what was being called libertarian online for a while. It's like the Insta Pundit sort of network. Sure. And right. that's, I mean, and I, I still think that with Iraq, Afghanistan is different, but with Iraq, I, I really think the strong inclination among libertarians. Um, was uh, against the war. There clearly were pro-war libertarians, but I think they were a minority. Sure. I mean, I, I wasn't paying enough attention. Like, I was 16 and getting a tonsillectomy when um, Iraq happened. <laughs> and my, I guess, I, I knew reason and I knew my dad, and I probably started reading a little Sheldon Richmond and Freedom Daily and stuff, but I didn't, I mean, I, I get a lot of my, my stuff sort of from Gregory's rantings and stuff, um, and he may not be a perfectly unbiased source, but I have found more 
softness about war that I would have, you know, that I wish that I had, um, there had been. And there, there still is. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. I still love reason, but uh, well, yeah, well, I Jesse's mean, Jesse's good. We like I, Jesse. I'm the, I'm the last person to talk about the uh, intellectual climate with libertarians during the Afghanistan and Iraq war when they're starting, but. It's definitely because I'm like Kyle. I was basically getting involved with with uh, the Ron Paul movement, so it's very bizarre to me to even conceive of a libertarian movement that is substantially uh, like there's a question like about war. It's just, it just seems like inherent, like Kyle said, inherently libertarian. So uh, we, there's there's always gonna like Lucy said, there's always gonna be uh, like you're always gonna be think the libertarian movement is too soft on war because because there's, there's, there's going to be outliers there that like I don't know, don't get it, I guess. And there's always going to be the media who decides yeah. to throw a libertarian label on, you know, everyone who wants some kind of reduced government, and a lot of the times they're not going to be libertarian on war. And you know, I think at this day and age, that's what separates. You know, there's there's all the talk between left and right libertarians and thin and thick. But you know, war should be kind of. I mean, in theory, it should be like the ultimate bastion of you know, true libertarianism. Well, it's like it's like this guy uh, running for state office here in Oklahoma who says that I'm mostly libertarian except that I think that we should stone gays. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of in the libertarian movement, is there too much, or do people? too often like try to strike people out and and banish them for taking positions that we don't like yeah absolutely because we're all libertarians you know but as far as like republicans saying they're stoning is a deal breaker though right yeah well I mean, yeah yeah there's I mean, simultaneously I'll too much stoning. Stoning. what what's that cory i'll tolerate some stoning i mean i don't want to kick anybody out like i said so you know, I mean, stunning. Maybe when you really stunning. look at it, you know, Stalin was pretty libertarian as well. I mean, he was, he was, he was getting there. But, but then if you start saying that about stoning, then I start saying, well, Leonard Peikoff is, you know, a sociopath, and he can leave, leave me alone. Um, and then you start kicking more people out. It's like, I, I don't know. Like, the infighting pisses me off because most of it is, is useless, but there's obviously, like, stoning... Stoning is a no-no. You know? That's a deal breaker. Yeah. That's what we call a deal breaker. <laughs> I mean, I would uh, say of all the like uh, big libertarians, Gary North has got to be my favorite. Uh, come on. <laughs> oh God, I, I like Ron Paul so much, and then I remember things like Gary North exists. <sighs> I mean, Gary North always wanted this stoning to be done privately, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. What's, private, what's the matter, right? So basically, a, a leftist, um, like a, a straw libertarian, that a leftist for Salon.com is writing about. And there's our segue. There's our segue to. Um, did any of you guys? And if you didn't, we can we can fake our way through. This. <coughs> the um, read the, jo the the latest Joan Walsh gem about gotcha. the outbreak of right wing violence because of that charming couple in um, Las Vegas who decided to shoot a couple of cops and. I guess I don't know if they've repeated it or confirmed it. With like they put a Gadsden flag over the dead people that the, the people they shot and like um, Jesse, like specifically Jesse, can you give us a little um, a little summation since you know yeah well, I mean, John Walsh for us basically. Well, I mean, there. Do you, you want me to summarize what John Walsh said or what happened in Las Vegas or? Well, if, if you if you know the, the Walsh thing, give us a little bit of her argument and then tell us what you think about it. Yeah, uh, well, Joan Walsh, uh, well, I mean, it was just a return to the old, um, we heard a lot of this in 2009, every time there was uh, someone who was or could be described at least as right-wing, whether or not the label makes sense um, in any particular case, um, killed or tried to kill somebody, you know, there was this effort to blame it on, you know, the rhetoric in the air. And she says, you know, I think her headline was, uh, do you have that in front of you? Um, it was, it was, let's see. I gotcha. It's I, I uh, it. Fox News. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, this is getting, we don't need some vaudeville crosstalk happening. Fox News foments, that's, is that a word? Foments, yeah. Another violent outbreak. From Clive and Bundy to Gerard Miller, words matter. So Fox News. Yeah, I mean, so, I, mean, the, I, 
I mean, because um, the Millers, this couple, had been at the Bundy Ranch, and they were kicked off. Um, they, uh, it, I mean, the guy, Jared Miller, said it was because they found out he was a felon, and he was very bitter about it. You can read his um, little comments he put on YouTube about it, uh, where he was you know, calling them loyalists and so on. Um, and there's some in some comment from one of the Bundy family, who, which basically says there was more to it than that, that they uh, had other issues on their mind and, um, you know, were a couple of hotheads. And th this, is kind of, this is something that actually happens. Fairham, I mean, with the small number of um, uh, violent um, political acts by people who might be called, you know, militiamen or um, patriot movement types, it's often within that, it's, it's a fair number of times, it's people who've been kicked out of a larger, more mainstream, if I can use that word, <laughs> militia um, and who then went off on their own or in a small group and committed this act. And in fact, in some of those cases, the larger militia alerted the cops and said, hey, we, we, that's, I mean, that's how the people got caught. They said, we, there are these, you know, assholes that were coming to our meetings and talking about killing people. I, we thought we should let you know. <laughs> um, in this case, they were sent back to Vegas. So anyway, that, that's my long way around of saying that that's the Bundy connection. And I guess she sort of is imagining that the Millers were inflamed by seeing all the coverage of the Bundy Ranch on Fox, which is nonsense. I mean, I've looked at this guy's um, Facebook page. I say this guy's because the wife's is more protected, so you can't see all of her updates. But Jared Miller is um, writing about um, – he's, he's speaking revolutionary language before he gets sucked into the Bundy thing. And, and maybe more important than that, I mean – He's last year he's complaining about the government. Why? Because he's being sent to jail on drug charges. Uh, he complains about um, an, an alleged outstanding. Uh, I don't remember if it was a warrant or, or missed. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but it was uh, some bureaucratic thing in another state that um, had to do with a previous conviction that was coming back to bite him. And he's saying this was unfair. It's pretty clear that to me that this guy um, was to at least a large extent, was radicalized by his own experiences. Um, and I would not be remotely surprised if he then glommed on to an ideology that, you know, fits with him. Uh, not like him. I mean, Fox News about going off and, and shooting the police. They, they mm -hmm. tend to be rather tend to defer to the police, if anything, right? So it, it's a bizarre accusation from Joan Walsh. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult for her, but I, it's a um, – and, I mean, at least in this – the guy's Facebook page is kind of interesting ideologically, too. But my favorite post there, just I mean, sort of weird to read, is he uh, puts up a little image macro that's got a picture of Bill Hicks, the comedian, and a quote from him. Oh. Um, and his dad comes on and says, that's very profound. He says, I don't know if you'd like this guy, Dad. He's kind of anti-Christian. <laughs> Dad says, oh, well, hey, anyone can have wisdom. So, it's, And there's a, one rather anarchistic um, post, too. So, well, he's in this sort of constitutionalist um, framework, militia patriot type framework. You know, it's clear that he's got some interesting edges mixed in as well, which I think is – you know, typical of these sort of freelance um, people rebelling against authority, and in this case, doing it in a really stupid and lethal way. Mm -hmm. Lucy, does that, does that answer your question, and Lucy? I ran on for a while. Oh no, that was good. I wanted to give you your time because you're the man who wrote the book on paranoia. So um, we'd like to know what uh, you have to say, Kyle. Uh, yeah, Lucy, can I just say that this is one of the things that the left does that really irritates me as far as just trying to shut up opposition. I've noticed it's, it's a rhetorical trick they use a lot, which is, uh, Joan Walsh says in her column, she says, you know, I was talking to Bill O'Reilly about this like a decade ago, and I told him, I told him, if you keep saying the things that you say, that people are going to do really dangerous things. And they always do that. And they forget that there's this serious leftist history of performing violent acts. I mean, the weather underground, like, are we kidding here? But they always, they, they've said it for the, for the last decade at least that I've noticed, even back when I was a liberal, the idea was that conservative ideas are dangerous or libertarian ideas are dangerous. And if you keep saying them, someone's going to kill somebody. It's ridiculous. And it's all it is, all it's meant to do is just to shut up anyone who disagrees with liberals. And, and in this case, I mean, it, it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go. No, I, 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 Jesse. 
It's not as though Salon has not covered, you know, police misbehavior. I, th I think they ran an excerpt from Radley's book when it came out last year. They you know? did, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, this guy may have read that, and that's not wrong of Salon to run it because it happens to be true, right? I mean, sometimes you can broadcast accurate inflammatory things, <laughs> and you have to trust that people will not react to it in a stupid and destructive way. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I, 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 there was an interesting um, one. I, I've also seen some things, and this is kind of on the right. Um, there's like a Washington Times piece that was sort of raising, is there like a war on cops now? People, uh, you know, cop killing, people forget. And they said that, that there were more cops killed this year than there was at this time last year. As it happens, last year had the fewest number of cops. I'm talking about raw number, not rate, killed since the late 19th century all year long. I mean, the yeah. year when it, there was the same amount, it was uh, the population was one fourth the, the size that it is now of the United States. So we are essentially at an all time low in the era of having, you know, uh, a whole lot of police departments around the country because, you know, urban police department in the U.S. So I uh, it, so, yeah, I'm not surprised it would be a little bit higher now, but whether it's people, you know, sort of, you know, Losing that historical context with cop shootings, with school shootings, with um, you know political violence like this Las Vegas thing, there's always this tendency to sort of act like we're in this uniquely violent age when, if anything, it, it's um, unusually nonviolent by historical standards. Yeah, um, I guess to to give Joan Walsh way too much, um, uh, what? Okay, my 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 question is. I, I, do, do you, you, Jesse, or, or any of you think that Walsh or anyone of that ilk who has this meme of, oh, God, the right, like, are they sincere, like, at all in, in their fears? Or are they just, you know, play, playing the game um, and, and, you know, doing the bipartisan squabbling thing? Like, are they, they seem sincerely afraid that there's some sort of new right-wing monster brewing, but... They're absolutely is. sincere. I mean... Okay. They're, they're absolutely sincere. Like, I don't know how many, and I, I'm not trying to, like, straw man at all, but I don't know how many, like, serious liberals you hang out with, but they've convinced themselves that ideas that are oppositional to liberalism are, are absolutely dangerous. Yeah. I mean, I think Salon kind of has this recent trend. It's probably not recent. It probably goes back along with why I ever started reading them, but they fear so much a shrinking of government that they've kind of started just, you know, Joan Walsh is famous for just kind of anything that goes against expanding government is just horribly evil. I mean, that, that's why they put a picture of Rand Paul on every single story they run about, you know, libertarianism. They're, you know, I think they have this idea that they, ha they have to fight back against the whole, like, shrinking of government no matter you know what they have to do and this is kind of you know they're preparing i guess for possibly you know a rand paul or a ted cruz in 2016 who you know probably won't be that libertarian to begin with but you know this idea of shrinking government is so evil and foreign to them that i think they're just you know going out there guns blazing but at the same time, it seems they're like obsessed with this caricature of libertarianism as you know the extreme, non-limited, like this confusing, limited government, but wants to attack our ovaries and you know keep us from uh, hanging out with who we want to. Or um, it, this this conversation we're having just reminds me of um, one time back in 2012, I was hanging out with a friend, eating lunch outside, and oh. Obama for America person came up and uh, asked us who we, were, who we were voting for. I said, well, I'm not voting for either Romney or Obama. And it's like, but you're a woman. You know, you, <laughs> and I'm like, well, and I brought up drone warfare. I brought up the drug war. And she's like, but you're a woman. <laughs> and that's it, terrible. Yeah, it, that's, that's what it all reminds Are we sure Joan Walsh isn't the, isn't the same Trader Joe's lady? Like, I feel, <laughs> are we sure we're not talking about the same person? But. Should that be our segue is the question now. To be, uh, <laughs> probably to be slightly um, strict I, with our I, timing. I, I, I would have maybe voted for Obama if someone had used that argument on me. But I'm <laughs> 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 I 
only they'd known. If only they'd known. I mean, it's um, ironic that uh, the, the mainstream tries to accuse uh, small government types of uh, kind of causing this kind of violence because of the rhetoric we use. Because we can. Because that's just speculation. And we can just factually show that the kinds of policies that the mainstream supports does cause violence and death. Like, we can just show them. Like, like oh, you support yeah. non-warfare. Well, there you go. I mean, it's not it's not rhetoric that's doing it. You're just outright explicitly supporting that. That's so true. And that's and, such a... Oh, well, I'm, I was going to... I'm sorry to break into your segue. But, I mean, there, there was this, this um, chart people were passing around compar comparing um, uh, terrorist incidents involving Islamists versus ones involving dom the domestic right. And, you know, then some of them actually... A couple of those people didn't belong on the second list, but let me leave that aside. Uh, I just started thinking to myself, um, wouldn't it be interesting to do a, uh, since in, in the context of the cop killing, um, to have a chart of, uh, you know, the police officers killed um, versus uh, non-criminals killed by police officers over the same time period? Of course, it's hard to do that because, uh, you know, which statistics are kept. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, that's the sort of comparison that doesn't even get brought into these discussions. Or if you bring it up, people think you're making an excuse for, you know, the killing rather than talking, trying to talk about where the um, violence is actually, the bulk of it is coming from, and, or at least that kind of violence. Well, sure. There's, I mean, there's, there's every single type of person on, on any side has this aversion to talking about the motivations for... I mean, sometimes, like, you know, Jared Lochner, that was the peak of, like, Sarah Palin literally killed those people type of, of bullshit. And he turned out to be apolitically insane. But, you know, he's talking about 9-11 or the Oklahoma City bombing or maybe these people in Vegas. Like, talk about why they might be mad. Hell, talk about the political climate of, you know, say, police brutality and think maybe that helped lead to these people doing this thing that, we're not, con you know, it's not about condoning it. It's about trying to trying to explain it. But even talking about it this way, I have to, I have to specify that I'm not condoning it. And meanwhile, you know, the police brutality and the war brutality and the state brutality is just condoned. It's, it's blowback. Not... It's blowback. Yeah. You don't you don't condone what the terrorists do, but you understand why they did it. Yeah. Well, now that's yeah. a, this is a perfect segue. We're not saying anything. That's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I feel like I, I, I destroyed your. Uh, no, your, Jesse, your, don't your, don't uh, apologize on air. Fake confidence is very important. You're it's all gone. You're on. Well, I think I think that there is a perfect segue there. Like not wanting to acknowledge the you know the things that make us feel uncomfortable. Like you know the Trader Joe's lady. Well, I'm sure Lucy will give background. Doesn't you know? sees like the misogyny in this music or whatever when there are in fact like bigger problems uh, regarding uh, you know misogyny in the world that she can focus on that are much more you know have much more of an impact rather than you know sending later uh, letters to you know Trader Joe's headquarters or whatever she was doing um, you know the same way you don't want to acknowledge you know the the drone warfare or the deaths in the drug war that was a really good attempted segue, um, <laughs> and I'm going to slightly ruin it by saying this also reminds me of um, Connor Friedersdorf wrote a piece some months ago, or uh, last year actually, when Rand Paul went to speak at Howard University, and um, the right, uh, the left was kind of like, oh, white Republican pandering to the black people, ha ha ha, and um, Friedersdorf just like summed it up really awesomely in a way that I hadn't really seen before, where he was talking about like, listen. You know, like, you know, in the libertarian world, you can talk about it in terms of like, okay, the Ron Paul newsletters, we all thought those were disgusting and we wish those didn't exist. Um, and there's no reason to, to act as if they were okay. But then you also, Ron Paul himself spent two different presidential campaigns explaining to a bunch of morons about blowback and basic exercises in empathy about if other countries came to this country and bombed it, we'd get mad. I mean, just like, it's like you have to choose between pretending that, that rhetorical racism or, or other prejudice is okay and then accepting actual life and death stuff. Um, uh, also, just... liberals know nothing about white people pandering to black people. <laughs> yes, that's true. That, um, every, I mean, uh, I just... <laughs>
I just, mm. okay, I'm just mad now. Okay, Michelle, we're gonna pretend that I didn't go off on that derailed tangent. See, Jesse, I did it way worse. I'm the host. All right, but the whole point is, uh, I got this. Uh, um, and I guess we're gonna skip the Rick Perry is a douche. We are all in agreement about that, right? He'll He's a douche. Be a douche next week. Nice. That's very true, Joe. He will be. Okay, so the Trader Joe's lady. Let's talk about this. Um, and it's going to segue into a little uh, query that I'll ask of each of you. So this woman who wrote for Alternet, which I once thought wasn't like actually worse than Salon, but apparently it is. It is. She she wrote I, a very. I, I once thought Salon was not worse than Salon. There's. <laughs> <laughs> quite quite. She I mean not only did she do this, but she wrote a piece about it as if it had any significance in the world. She went to Trader Joe's and she heard the Rolling Stones under my thumb playing. And in the wake of the Elliot Rogers um, misogyny massacre, um, or actual real massacre, which is slightly more relevant, the killing people, um, she decided, oh, under my thumb, it's about controlling women and why are they playing this in this public place? And then she complained and the Trader Joe's employees were you know, unimpressed by her complaints. And darn it, we shouldn't have songs like that. It's just, it's a very inane piece, but there's so much to talk about because it's so fucking annoying. <laughs> um, it's my show, we can swear. Um, can, do, we, do we have thoughts on this piece? I mean, isn't all rock and roll pretty, you know, misogynistic? Yes. Yeah, right? I mean, there's, it, it really is actually a really misogynistic song. If you yes. Read the lyrics, it's really bad. But is it I, worse than brown sugar, though? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, it's probably uh. <laughs> I just had to, you know, my problem was her comparing it to Elliot Rodger. And like, yeah, like that has anything to do with that, anything. That comes yeah. out of nowhere. If she had just, you know, if she wants to complain about those lyrics, that's, you know, that's fine. But, you know, trying to link it to this bigger piece, you know, make it this big think piece, this salon pitch, I thought was just stupid and ruined the whole, you know, argument for me. Like... You can criticize popular culture as being sexist or racist or whatever while still acknowledging it's a great song. Like you can say, you can yes. say, hey, look at these lyrics. They're ridiculous. But this song is fucking awesome. But there's also, though, I mean, the persona element to music that, you know, back in the, uh, the Chipper Gore hates music era, um, you know, the, the, the PRMC, I can't remember exactly what it stood for. The, the, you know, the... The, the whole music resource center, I think. Yeah, that's probably it. Old guy. Um, <laughs> um, I, I watched entire Oprah episodes that were put on YouTube where she's talking to like, to Tipper Gore and Ice T and Jello Biafra, and Ice T is like really kick-ass, eloquent, and he talks about you know he has these horribly misogynistic, violent songs, and it's an exaggeration of the the. the Partly like actual violence that he's seen and the way that the men are talking to each other on the corner and that sort of thing. And obviously like, you know, really silly metal about like feeding your baby to Satan and stuff is also a persona in spite of what people seem to think in the 1980s and 90s as well. And I just think that at the end of the day, people always forget that it doesn't, it's not you, it's not, you know, Mick Jagger necessarily raping slaves in brown sugar. I mean, it's not. Um, Country music is a persona. Music is about playing a part. I made a huge uh, Spotify playlist about murder songs. Yes. Um, does, that, does that make me a creep? And uh, there are always ones that switch. It's not just about killing your no good woman. Sometimes it's about killing your no good man. Like mm -hmm. Frankie and Johnny is an example of that. I mean, I listen, but like some of the, the murder ballads that I tend to listen to, like they're, they're not, you know, they're not just... Um, exaggerations they're about actual people who were actually murdered usually in the 19th century and stuff and it's not it's a bit morbid but it's like part of this amazing culture that we have and just the laziness of this piece just annoyed the hell out of me i guess nick cave um, man yes we don't blame actors for you know exactly playing killing people like i mean you you just have to be smarter than that and that's not something we can expect from a piece in Salon or Alternate or whatever it originally <laughs> you know, showed up. Yeah. Um, Where do people find the energy to complain about these things? 
Like, I yeah. don't have any of that. Just... I mean, I have my, like, my feminist irritations. Like, I don't like Cosmo. I wish the Oxford American was more popular than Cosmo, and it's mm-hmm. really not. <laughs> but I just, this is, partic- this is particularly People innate. People about things that they don't need to do any particular investigation of to have an opinion on. That's why the longest hidden run threads are always the ones about the you know, easy plug-in cultural debates because mm-hmm. you, know, you don't have to pause to think and and if it can just be a, something as um, as simple as whether you like the Rolling Stones or find them creepy and heaven knows there's enough in their personal stories to be creeped out by those guys and you know there's plenty of good music they put together so you can take whatever part. I mean that's that's why it's, it's easy to write and it's clickbait you know because I'm here we are talking about it. actually we are more pathetic because we are complaining ah. about the woman complained to Trader Joe. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Jesse. Back over to Alternate and read that. No one was blasting her, her reading it aloud over the loudspeakers at Safeway. Fair enough. Um, I don't have a Trader Joe's in Oklahoma City, so I don't even know what that is. Uh, well, it's a, it's just it's very white liberal feminist woman e the whole piece. Is it like Whole Foods? In the worst way. It it's is like Whole Foods. Cheaper, it's cheaper than Whole Foods. That's, that's true. Whole Foods is like really good stuff that costs less than Safeway. And that's oh. why I like, like the Aldi's. Of- it's is sponsored by Trader Joe's. No, it's not. Stop talking about grocery stores. <laughs> that tangent I won't allow. Sorry. Um, I want to ask you guys, I think actually we're going to call this our, our um, better than politics uh, segment where we talk about briefly about entertainment things that we really like. And um, I want to ask you guys in turn, what, give me a couple of examples of something sexist or any kind of prejudiced culture that you enjoy. Um, and I enjoy, oh, there I am, let's see. All right, I, I really love Charles Bukowski. Um, I like Hell NWA. Yeah. I like all sorts of inappropriate murder ballads. Um, ooh. The British sitcom Coupling, the show Red Eye, because let's be real, I mean totally, and uh, I mean there's, there's a lot of stuff that's legitimately like it's bad in certain ways and it's really fucking good. So uh, give me some, what, what do you guys like, uh, Michelle? We'll, we'll go in turn. I am a huge South Park fan, mm-hmm. and uh, they have tons. I mean, the main one of the main characters awesome. is a Jewish kid. And they, you know, poke fun of him all of the time. They mm-hmm. made South Park made Jew jokes acceptable. At least, you know, no one talks about like, oh, did you see that thing on South Park last night? I mean, that was years ago when people would say that, like when the show began. But eventually, it just, you know, everyone just, oh yeah, that's South Park. They always do that stuff. Uh, they have a black chef who always sings, or they had, you know, they have a talking poop. Um, there are a bunch of rape jokes, a uh, bunch of sexist jokes. Uh, you I'm know, so happy it, when you talk about this, which I love. You're just yeah. about it. I love South Park. Yeah, it's one of my favorite shows. Um, and yeah, that's what I love. All right, Kyle, do you have do you have any any culture that's terrible and you should feel bad about loving? Well, uh, I mean, my two favorite styles of music to listen to are classical and hip hop, and I really love hip hop a lot, um, no matter what the lyrics are about. I really like Las Vegas. It's my favorite place in the world. And it is very sexist, just in general. Um, right? Maybe. I don't know. Probably. Mm-hmm. But um, I like go-go dancers a lot. That's kind of sexist. I don't know. Objectification. All right. Uh, Jill? Uh, everything Led Zeppelin has ever done. <laughs> or okay. sexist. Pretty much all of rock and roll is just a black hole of misogyny. No, and... just like... Ninety. No, I mean, even the Beatles, John Lennon beat his wife and wrote a song about it, and it was all happy and nobody cared. Yeah, Matt Welsh pointed that out. <laughs> Run for your life if you can, little girl. Uh, well, Honestly, that, Franco is that sexist. Band. It's getting better, you know. <laughs> Literally I, talked about beating his wife. I, I, used to listen, I, listened, I blasted that song when I was like 10 years old. I right, love that it song. sounds so happy. And <laughs> who, who on earth, you know, besides the, the jerks who don't like John Lennon, have ever really pointed that out, so. They have, but they let it be. But then it's like, oh yeah, my God, I didn't wrote, that. you know, a day in a life. <laughs> That's, you know. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, uh, Jesse? Oh, um, so are we doing stuff that, like, 
plays with this stuff or actually like really exemplifies it. Cause I see South park. I mean, they enjoy walking the line, you know, they know people take their stuff in different ways, but they're clearly on some level making fun of it. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sometimes people do that. Like Robert Crumb sets out to use racist um, caricatures to poke fun at racism, but then he does fall into racism sometimes as he's doing that, I, I would argue, you know? But, and also sometimes something can be purely satiric, but someone takes it a different way. I mean, there's a, um, I, n I never did write this story up. Um, there's like a Persian restaurant near where I live, um, north of Baltimore, where the, um, the guy who runs it is, I, don't, I doubt he still does it because the Borat moment has passed, but he was a Barat impersonator. You could oh, Lord. Him. It's yeah. very multi-layered. To uh, go Borat. to a party oh, and, yeah. and do a Barat, a Barat act. And at the same time, I happen to know, um, uh, just because I was Googling his, his, his name for reasons I need not get into, uh, well, I will tell you, he, was, he had these like extreme right-wing stuff uh, publications out front at his restaurant. And I saw when I was asking his card, because I... I wanted to um, order, like, uh, see if he had delivered, because he had these great sandwiches, that he actually had a card for distributing the American Free Press, which is like this Willis Carto white nationalist um, outfit. Oh, dear. And so I was wondering, like, is this guy, like, sort of naive? He's like a conspiracy guy, and he's um, and he doesn't realize what these people, who's behind this operation, or is he into it? And I looked it up, and I found, like, this sort of article where he's off in um, – with a group of people visiting the old SS grave sites dressed in Nazi uniforms. And so this person oh, going around at parties saying these anti-Semitic things under the guise of Barat is oh. himself, presumably this flaming anti-Semite. I, I, you can just layer this on. I say, that would make a great point, movie. What is quote unquote really happening here? Yeah, uh, that's incredible. I don't eat at a restaurant anymore. <laughs> you know, sandwiches are great. Um, <laughs> but, but I didn't answer your question. So Stephen Foster. <laughs> Father of American popular song, uh, music, uh, songwriting, um, minstrel show tradition, lots of words about darkies and so on. In there. Every song has, do, every, is, they all the, say darkies. All Stephen Foster songs have the word darkies in it, as far yeah, as Yeah, you know, but I mean, without Stephen Foster, where is American music? So, mm -hmm. you know, you got to take the bad with the good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and your R. Crumb reference reminded me that I grew up on Tintin, which is super racist, and yeah. it's so good, though. It was so cool. Um, uh, Corey, do you have any? Uh, yeah, the um, the first thing that came to mind was uh, one of my favorite uh, shows, Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It was like really absurdly racist and homophobic a lot. And um, I, I thought of a specific, like, what's the guy who plays uh, Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings? Ian McCollin. Ian McCollin. Ian McCollin, yeah, at some point. I don't know if any of you will watch this show, but just to give an example of some of the homophobic jokes, uh, in one episode, I distinctly remember Ian McKellen coming up, and the character Mac starts talking about how Ian McKellen, like, blasts magic into his boyfriend's assholes. <laughs> and, like, this is just, like, the absurdity of the homophobia on the show. But the show's really fucking funny. So, well, it's like when they go to the, Chinatown looking for monkey, yeah, yeah, and the guy know. actually has monkey. The China, You know, he's like, oh, we got monkey. Yeah, you know, it's... it's when great. you play with that, type, any kind of thing like that, sometimes you are just being racist or uh i mean and, and sometimes sometimes it's multi-layer and sometimes it isn't i'm suddenly reminded that um herge the, the the cartoonist who did tintin his very first i think comic was tintin in the congo no, and but... it was so racist that he actually felt bad later but he he was totally the racist first was Tintin in the land of the Soviets. Okay, that's right. That one, the Congo um, one's the only one I haven't actually read. The Soviet one is a whole other bag of fascination. Yeah. Um, there... Like, with the Kulaks, and like, oh, um, we can talk about that forever. There's an but, uh, racist episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, they, like, go to some planet where all the people there, are, and they're, like, they're, I don't know if they're people, but they're, they look like people, they're humanoids, and they're black, but their culture is basically just, like, what you would, like like, think African Americans would have lived like in Africa. Yeah, it's there's some. Like, yeah, sci-fi has that sort of thing. Very bizarre. It's weird for Star Trek, though, considering yeah. Roddenberry. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I guess final, generally, like, and uh, that sort of devolved into just like talking about racist things we like, which wasn't so. so Did really anyone like anything that's not racist? I mean, <laughs> is everyone here just an irredeemable bigot? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why we're here, actually. Ta-da, that was a surprise. 
Um, but like, I don't. The law's yeah. right. <laughs> I don't think my enjoyment of Tintin as a child and my enjoyment of um, murder ballads and NWA, NWA is kind of super homophobic a lot of the time. Um, like, I, I, I don't feel sullied by that. I like that I was allowed to have a lot of culture around me when I was growing up and stuff. And I don't, I, I don't know. It's not like you shouldn't talk about if something does strike you as like bad, but it's just, I don't know. The, the summation is just, culture is better than politics and even with these little unfortunate prejudiced sprinklings um, it's it's not it's not the thing that's killing anybody or ruining any lives it I guess. talks about it, race it, it I to kill people or actually oppress anyone right well yeah. I, I mean it, it can make life unpleasant for someone if you find yourself watching something you enjoy and then they, you see like this horrible caricature of you up there but at the same time you know I watch um, old Bugs Bunny cartoons with, you know, my older daughter all the time. And they're great. I mean, I, I feel like I'm actually doing her a service, exposing her to great culture. But sometimes I have to turn to her and say, that was pretty racist. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not like the big teaching moment, but you have to sort of like, you know, acknowledge, you know, that this is uh, in there. So. Right. That's, that's, I mean, I think just acknowledging it and not, not necessarily throwing out everything that includes that because so much of it's old. Otherwise you start, you know, uh, having versions of, of um, Huckleberry Finn where you cut out the word nigger because, you know, you can't say that anymore, but it's what the book said. It's the past, and it's this, you know, the, the slave is the hero of the story, and it's this brilliantly, subversively enlightened thing. It just is of its time. And Well, they should also change it so he's not a slave. Because... <laughs> I mean, they basically want to do that. It's it's offensive. Like I was looking at this list of, of Jesus banned books, Christ. and it's I mean, banned for racism. Huckleberry Finn, you know, and another um, God, even uh, To Kill a Mockingbird was mentioned, like with the Saint um, Atticus. Uh, oh God, what's his name? Finch. Finch. You know, like tr trying to save the guy, and like the fact that racism is in the story is racist. It's just, I don't know. It's. You, Jesse wa ex watching the cartoons and explaining when something is maybe a problem. That seems like the ideal thing to me. And obviously maybe, you know, we don't need to read the Turner Diaries or something that's probably just terrible. But I've totally looked up the Turner Diaries when I was researching Timothy McVeigh for my thesis. So, I don't know. There's, I have no brilliant summation here, I guess. But um, I think we're out of time. And we rambled because it was a really good talk, you guys. Um, actually, the end of it... Um, I want to promote any of you, uh, y'all's fine work to the crowds of people. Um, Corey, where can we see your works on the internet? Tell, uh, the, tell the good people. Uh, check out uh, c4ss.org where I write op-eds and book reviews, and then also uh, the June edition of the New Leveler, which is an individual's anarchist newsletter, is coming out in a couple of days. Awesome. So check, check out that also on c4ss.org. Awesome. Uh, Kyle? <laughs> uh, all my stuff's on liberty.me. Well, this will this will be there eventually, so yay. Yeah. Um, Michelle and Joe, you guys usually just give me... Do you have any words? <laughs> I don't uh, mean to shame you for not doing things. I'm sorry. Follow me on Twitter, and I'm building a website for John Staggerwald's new book. Our uncle, that yeah, guy. Our uncle and our father is getting a new website, so... That's good. Look for those in the future. Good, I'll do that. Thank you, Joe. That was very informative. Um, and Jesse, where can the people see your works? Uh, well, they can buy this if they really want to, you, you know, help me pay for dinner. Um, <laughs> and they can read me at Reason. And I occasionally at uh, Salon, but that's a... Uh, I confess <laughs> that. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yes, you should... Everyone should read Jesse's book because it's really good. Um, Though, to be fair, he technically gave me a copy, and I didn't pay for it. I'm sorry, Jesse. Um, all right, we're done. Corey, uh, Jesse, Joe, Michelle, and Kyle, thank you so much for joining me. This was an awesome talk. See you guys it's a pleasure. Next time.